the story of Upbuild began in a monastery. On our quest to understand ourselves more deeply, we recognize that it is our attachment to our egos, our identities, that gets in the way of being our true selves. This podcast will help you understand your ego. It will help you better understand your inner world, the motivations, insecurities, and emotions that affect your every action and relationship. Welcome to Upbuilding the Self. Hi, Hari. Hi, Rasana. Hey, Ripen. Hey. I'm so excited to be with you for this. So to open this conversation, I was just telling you about this, that we had a family and friends staying with us this past weekend, and somehow the conversation made its way to religion and spirituality, which may be not surprising, but it was um, actually a really uh, provocative conversation. And in the context of our extended family, they were talking about how there are so many rituals that we perform in the family and that people often perform those rituals without really understanding why they're doing it. And they were referring to that as faith. And it struck me how when they used the word faith, they were talking about blind faith. That there was an assumption that faith equated to blind faith. and that was separate from someone who understood why they believed what they believed. This is just, I'm doing it because I've, I've seen it done this way, or I've been told to do it this way. And I was thinking, oh, my association with faith is so different than that because of our class on spirituality, the call to awaken. And in that class, there's a session that we do called faith and knowledge. And every time we teach that class, I come away from that session with a completely different understanding of faith or the the following times with a reinforced understanding of faith that actually faith is everywhere in my life. And as Hari Prasad, you put it earlier, I'm exercising faith all of the time. And so Rasnath, when you suggested this topic, I was so excited for us to share the understanding that I've received from that class and that session in particular with our audience, because I think it it has been paradigm shifting for me. And faith is such a, it can be such a polarizing word. And so how different to think about faith as something, a blind faith associated with religion, very polarizing to I'm made of faith. <laughs> so let's start this journey with the question, why is faith usually associated with blind faith? So I did some research. I just uh, put the word faith in Google. And one of the first things that comes up in Webster is directly associated with the existence of a God. And faith used in the context of religion. So the association of faith and religion are very, very tight. Yes, intertwined. (laughs) They're very extremely intertwined, which is why, and you know, this is a little more historical, the word faith is associated with religion very directly. They're just like so intertwined and anything else is considered to be, you know, you can give it various names, you can give it rationality, you can give it belief. But somehow the word faith is very tightly associated with religion. Yeah. Well, I mean, even when you say, what is your faith? That can be a substitute for your religion. There's faith in that definition, but then there's also your faith within whatever tradition you're in. And your feeling of, like you're saying, very tightly coupled with God and religion. That's right. And in general with language, this is part of the challenge that we don't necessarily understand the etymology. And so much of the usage of words is colloquial and contextual. And then it carries its own meaning with time. The actual etymological meaning of a word just goes away. And what remains is what it's associated with. Right. Are you going to take us through the etymology now? (laughs) Uh, I was thinking the same thing. (laughs) So we know it's tied, tightly coupled to religion, but why blind faith? That's still an open question. 
Let me offer something on that point. So in Christianity, there's a, a dilemma that, that is sort of a debate that's open, which is what's more important, faith or works? So you have on the one side people that say, well, your belief in what you can't see is more important. You just have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You just have to believe. Even though you really don't know, that takes a lot to believe without knowing. So that's most important. And that's what Jesus came to instill in us is that faith. And then there are others that say, well, look at the saints. They do good works. That's something which they're known for is even to become a saint, you have to perform miracles and you live an exemplary life and you do good. So that, that's very practical and concrete and clear. And then there are people that say, well, it's, it's both, that they're equally important. You need faith and works. And what we would suggest is that it's not faith or works. It's works based on faith and based on a different understanding of what that faith is. It's not just like, well, I don't know, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so if we tie it back to the rituals <laughs> and not knowing why I'm doing it, but doing it anyway, we would say that that's some level of faith. But deeper faith is you know why you're doing it. And you have conviction, you have trust. Faith is synonymous with trust, with confidence, with conviction. That's a much higher level of faith. So when you do anything in this world from that understanding of faith with that level of conviction, it's extremely impactful. And even on the material side, and we'll talk a lot more about this, but even on the material side, when we see people that have that level of faith in themselves, and that level of faith in what they're offering, we tend to become attracted. We tend to be more impacted. And what they do carries more weight. Yeah. So when you were talking about faith and works, you said faith without knowing. It's interesting because the session we do is called faith and knowledge. Yes. So th this is a really important relationship, mm -hmm. faith and knowledge, because you might think if I know, then what's the need for faith? because I know. So faith almost presumes a not knowing and therefore the association with blind faith, because if I don't know, then I just have to have faith in something and, and, and pray that I have it right. <laughs> Help us debunk this relationship between faith and knowledge. I think one quote that Martin Luther King gives, which is so powerful and which we use in the call to awaken, addresses it. He's defining faith as taking the next step without seeing the full staircase. That means you have to know that there is a step to take and you have to know that there's a staircase that's going to lead you somewhere to a destination, but you may not be able to see it all yet. Very helpful. Yeah, Rasanath. If we really analyzed our own lives as children, think about the first words that I learned and learned how to associate a word, a language with a particular object or learned how to, how to see how things worked, is because someone explained them to me. Someone explained that that word is associated with that. With that particular object. This is what this means. Yeah. And I don't even have the faculties to question. Think about that. I don't even have the faculties to question. I just take that as reality. Would we call that blind? Right, so your parent is saying, this is a ball. Ball, ball, ball. It's repeated over and over again. And then you start repeating it yourself. You start repeating it. Ball. And now I know that this is a ball. That's so how right. do I know that? Because I have faith that what I've been told is correct. And think about how implicit that is. If you don't think that those are our first steps in learning. Now, if I were to break that even further, when I hear those words... I trust my own sense, uh, my senses to actually understand certain words, how they are being spoken, how they are being associated with. I trust my faculties, my sensory faculties to even take in what is being said. Even that is so implicit. 
And later on in life, I also understand that my senses don't necessarily see or understand things completely. And yet, in my first steps, very, very basic steps of making sense of the world, I have what we may call blind faith in my senses and blind faith you know, in the people that are trying to explain things to me <laughs> first. So just to make sure that this is crystal clear, when you're talking about faith in the senses, you're saying, so in the ball example, as a baby, my parent is pointing at the ball and saying the word ball, and my senses are able to deduce that they're associating ball with that object. Right. And That's I'm right. trusting that they weren't pointing to the light or the oven or something like I've That's correctly fine. identified the coupling of the ball and, and then, and even the language and I'm able to repeat it, the sound, all of those things. That's what you're talking about when you're saying That's I'm right. trusting my senses. And then, and then the other level is I'm trusting the person who is sharing right. this information that they're not leading me astray, that that must be, I don't even, obviously, like you said, we don't even have the faculty. We don't even question. We don't even question. That's right. Just receiving that, yeah. Right. right. You hear about people that have been brought up in a cult. People love to read these articles about someone who was brought up in a cult and their entire orientation in the world is skewed. And it's like, wow, how unfortunate, how unfortunate, how unfortunate, how crazy. Can you believe that stuff exists? We are all part of a cult of the mainstream. And then within that, we have many subdivisions. We're all being indoctrinated according to the consciousness of the people around us. That's how we know what's what. Do we really know what's what? What if we were to trace it back? What if we were to actually examine all of our assumptions? We would wind up with a very different understanding. I want to come back to the first question because I want to make sure we've answered why is faith associated with blind faith? So Rasanath, you said faith is intertwined with religion. And that's been there for a long time. We have this association, but it still leaves the question, why do we consider it blind? And we're talking a little bit about knowledge and faith. When people talk about faith, why do we associate it with blind faith? So think about, again, when you, when you go back to how a child learns, what options does a child have? But we don't even generally we don't even associate that with faith. Like you're you're associating it with faith here in right. this conversation. But most people would never even connect that to faith. That is what we are trying to highlight here is that that is, when I learned what I learned as a child, that was blind faith. That was blind faith. It's essentially coming from a place where I don't have the faculties. This is the only way I can learn. And then when you think about blind faith as we grow, we also begin to see how, for example, when we talk about religion, a lot of what we experience about religion is also coming from a place of desperation. We see that a lot of faith in religion is built because of some sort of desperation, which also lends it a sense of like, well, that is blind. But it is in some way very similar to how we learn as like kids. <laughs> there is a certain blindness associated with it. And what we can see is when we understand the similarity behind it, we don't pass a value judgment on it. <laughs> we can understand why that is the case. And that is a very important part of understanding that development of knowledge, very foundationally, very fundamentally, requires some level of faith. And many times, I mean, not even many times, it usually starts with blind faith. So what you're saying is faith is usually associated with blind faith appropriately, because that is a, often a component of faith. And when you come down to its absolute starting point, it is blind. Except there's often something that brings us to that faith where there's some kind of intercession, something that interrupts our system that feels like knowledge. And it may be knowledge, <laughs> depending on what is the source. <laughs> so if somebody approaches me 
and says, hey, are you Jewish? <laughs> on the street. This has happened to me many times when I've been out on the streets. And then I, I understand that this person wants to make me really Jewish. <laughs> this person wants me to come on the path of what they're believing in. And so if I feel like, hey, you know what? My paradigm is not so influenced by religion, but this person seems to know what is what. This person seems to know, understand what the Torah has to offer and seems to be happy and benefiting from it and is enthusiastic to share it with others. Then I might say, okay, hey, let me try this out. So I don't know exactly what's on the other side of this, but I have enough knowledge based on seeing the person and the person, if they quote something from the Torah, that might give me some knowledge. And it sounds like, yeah, I could learn from this. So then I put my faith in it, right? That's, that's an example. Okay, that's great. So you're, you're, you're assimilating data all the time. And so even in, in a situation like that, yes, you're interpreting a thousand signals exactly that might give you the impetus to take that step like you're talking about the staircase from MLK that uh, there you don't know where this might lead but there's something that gives you the faith to inquire to engage in a conversation that's right that's right so faith and knowledge are rarely ever separate okay so let's talk about what is important about this topic? Like, why did we want to explore this topic? Because we're putting faith in things all the time, constantly. And the question is, what is the value of that faith? What could we put our faith into, not unconsciously, but intentionally, that will actually increase the value of our existence? Yeah. We were saying we are putting our faith into things unconsciously, unintentionally, all of the time. All the time, nonstop. Let's talk about this. If I'm listening, I'm like, I don't know that that's true. Give me give me examples to show me that I am a faithful being, no matter whether I think of myself as a faithful being or not, that is a daily part of my life. It comes down to the most basic functions of life where you know I do the basic actions of like turning on a tap. I've shared this example. I turn on the faucet. I have faith that water will come out. I just do. <laughs> I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> right? It is that foundational. I call a car or I sit in a vehicle. I don't necessarily ask the driver, hey, do you know how to drive? Where did you learn? Where did you go to a driving school? How old were you when you, like, do you really know how to drive? I don't do that. And if somebody does that, you would say, hey, that's paranoia. That is a paranoid person. The other person can say, well, you're blind. I'm not blind. I'm not blind. Let's take this turning on the tap and water comes out of the faucet. Now you're saying, I have faith that water will come as soon as I turn that on. What else could that be? It tests your faith when the water gets turned off in the building and you turn on the tap very innocently, not knowing that. And it's a shock to the system. And then you, it's Something happens where occasionally I'll remember that when the water's back on and I'll be like, I really hope that water comes out of here. So there is a way in which our faith gets tested. Our faith gets formed and it gets tested in everything we do. You know, public speaking is the number one fear, right? That comes up a lot in polls. And if I give a talk and it went well, then I feel like, okay, I have some faith that I can do this. I have some faith in myself because I'm a good speaker. I'm that kind of person. And then if I give a talk another time and it doesn't go well, people are booing at me or they're just totally disinterested and distracted. It's hard that that tests my faith. And then I have to do that much more to regain that faith. So faith is operating all the time, but it's also very delicate and very vulnerable. And our experience is what informs our faith. What happens in our life experience is what determines where our faith goes and how strong it is. What if I replace faith with confidence? Like, I understand what you're describing with public speaking. And what if I say, that's really about having confidence in yourself and losing confidence. And then, Rasnath, if you talk about the tap, going back to the tap, like, well, what if 
I were to say, well, that's actually, I understand the mechanics of this. And based on how the water is flowing, where the tank sits, what happens mechanically when you turn the tap on, that's just science. Water will come. And if there's, if it doesn't, there's actually an explanation for that. Like the water main was in the building was shut off. So help us understand why are these, why are you saying that this is faith instead of science and confidence? Well, well, why is that different? Why is it different? Why are we distinguishing confidence from faith? What's the difference? (laughs) Do you know? Do you really know? How much do you know? Confidence is about like, well, I don't fully know, but I'm knowing enough to invest and believe. We often laugh at this. I think it's the 60 Minutes video, right? Where Tiger Woods is being interviewed. Yes, yes. And the interviewer asks him, well, you know, do you, do you know that you will win every single time you go, go out there? And Tiger Woods says, yes. And then the interviewer asks him again, every single <laughs> time. And then you see Tiger Woods flinch. And then he says, well, you just got to have the belief that that's what's going to happen. It's just a belief you have to have. It's just a belief you have to have. <laughs> that's faith. And one of the things that that I've encountered several times is as soon as you start to open this topic, everything starts to become queasy because now I'm suddenly thinking about all the things that I have done without necessarily intentionally doing them. And suddenly I realize. Well, I took steps. I took so many steps. So for the first, even without knowing science, the first time I open a faucet, how much of science do I really know? Right. You're saying as a kid, you do it, you have an experience. You actually have the experience that when I do this, water comes out. And then I just, and then I just have faith that that will happen every time. That will happen every time. I do it the first time. I do it the second time. I do it the third time. And and then it keeps happening again and again. And so then it then it just becomes, I don't I don't think about it. <laughs> yeah. Just to really underscore this. So I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, we have this term, like I have a lot of faith in myself. I have faith in myself, but you gotta have faith in yourself. That means I have to be confident. We're actually using them synonymously for a reason. Because what is the separation actually at the end of the day? And to the point about like science. Well, there is science of different kinds. And as Drasanath mentioned, I may not understand the science, but I know that it's functioning where I learn later on that it's functioning. The same is true for the things that we don't yet know. The same is true for the sciences that we haven't yet learned. And even metaphysics, even spiritual science, something is operating, but I haven't yet learned how it operates. So even when I sit in the class and, you know, you say this is science, like, how do I know how these things are functioning? An electron is an example. Right? When I first learned about the atomic model, it was very exciting because it was pretty incredible at like how these things can be explained and how things were happening on a microscopic level. How do I know it's true? How do I know it's actually happening? I don't. You you have faith that some other teacher has seen it. Right. And you know what's interesting? Even my teacher probably hasn't. <laughs> uh, yep. His teacher. Someone's teacher. <laughs> Somewhere, somebody did an experiment five centuries ago, four centuries ago, that was documented. And I have faith in an entire system that validates it. And I'm basically saying, well, I have... So, but I don't say it that way, right? I just say this is science. It gives you more credibility. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I care about, credibility. <laughs> Which is why we are having this conversation is like, let's not fool ourselves. <laughs> let's not fool ourselves in terminology that makes us look as though we are way more sophisticated than somebody else employing exactly the same techniques but may not be so sophisticated in explaining it away. Yeah. So, you know, Hari, you brought out this point that there's sort of science that we know, and then there's spiritual science that we may not be so knowledgeable about. Yeah. Also, interesting what you said about confidence. So if you actually replace 
faith, with confidence. Like even the example you gave where you met the person who said, hey, are you Jewish? And then, you know, proceeded to share more with you. You had confidence that this would be a worthwhile exchange. So then you you have, whether, it, you know, was that faith? Is it not faith? You had a certain amount of confidence to go forward, to take that next step. And so somehow in the world of science that we know, saying we have a lot of confidence that someone has said this, someone has seen it, someone has done run the experiment. And so I can build on top of all of this knowledge that already exists. And in the world of spirituality, it feels like a free for all because no one has any sort of everyone has their own beliefs and there's no unifying science around it and so it's almost like i have very low confidence then in anything because it seems like every belief is an n of 1 i mean I, that's an exaggeration but that's the divergence between when how people think about science which is an accumulated, cohesive, with uh, like quotes around cohesive, <laughs> uh, <laughs> knowledge base. And then there's the world of spirituality that feels not aligned, not cohesive, and hard to prove. Well, I, I think that's where we have a lot of assumptions. But yes, you're representing the common conception and the same conception that I walked through the doors of spirituality with. And that made it so difficult for me to even want to arrive at those doors, what to speak of walk through. But if you look at Thomas Kuhn's work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, you'll see it is far from cohesive, the whole scientific understanding. And this is happening all the time, but we glorify it as progress. We call it progress. It's a euphemism for we screwed up. We don't know what we're talking about. We don't know if what we believe in right now is true, but hey, we'll get there one day. Srila Prabhupada, my guru's guru, he would call it post-dated checks. Yeah, yeah, one day we'll understand for sure, for sure, for sure. But right now we're doing pretty well going towards that. It's progress. It's all progress. But it's, it's actually one revolution after another that completely tears apart the previous belief system and makes it sound primitive. And we are so fond of looking back, as Carl Sagan would say, with a kind of sympathy for the previous belief system, not realizing that that's what we're enmeshed in. We're enmeshed in a previous belief system. And you could say, well, well we're all moving in the right direction. It's all good. And it's working for us right now. It's great what is it based on? It's based on a lot of blind faith. It's based on a lot of blind faith. So then if you go in the other direction with spirituality, there's also a process. There's also a way of testing and verifying. And there's a lot to be said about that. And there are those who have done those experiments and who have come out on the other side and who have verification that matches with others. And this is what the scientific community looks for. Can you verify? Can you reperform the same experiment? Can you recreate those same conditions amongst different parties and arrive at the same result? Oh, well, yes, you can. And William James, who is considered one of the founding fathers of modern psychology, he wrote a work called uh, On the Variety of Religions, where he took a cross-section of all different traditions from different parts of the world that have seemingly nothing to do with each other. And he looked at mystics within them. And what is their experience? How do they describe it? And miraculously, there is science that comes out of that. Wow, they're experiencing something very similar and verifiable. It's a science. So what happens is the sample set that we actually choose to study, and this is potentially our judgment about religion as blind faith. Unfortunately, the sample set that exists are potentially people not performing the experiments if I study a sample of really like bad, bad students and see them performing experiments and dismiss the entire subject, who's blind? And that is what we see happening. We dismiss an entire subject because our uh, few and far experiences of bad samples. And here you're referring to in religion. In religion, yeah. Right. And this is true universally, right? Like this is what we do. 
is we just dismiss the entire, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We just say, hey, this is the entire subject is farce because the samples that I have, that I've encountered don't work. Which is why there is so much association. And again, there is a reason why there is so much association of blind faith with religion. But if we really break it down, this is true about all walks of life. And the idea is not science is bad or these fundamentalist ideas that you often hear. It's we don't see our own blind faith in science. That's what's bad. That's what needs to change for us to grow. So I can dismiss the entire field of science. In 2006, when I was at, a student at Cornell, a very famous, a very well-known Nobel laureate, we gave a talk about science and religion. He was doing a series on science and different topics, science and math. And the last day was science and religion. And his basic premise was that religion should cease to exist because of things that we have been talking about the blindness of it, the effects that it has actually created, and all of that. And post the conversation, I was walking out with the the physics professor who had helped organize, and we were just having a conversation about it. And I went on to ask him, so what about the atom bomb? Wasn't that a scientific discovery? What about anything in the hands of people who are committing crimes? And how has it actually come to be? Think about explosives. Isn't that science? That has actually led to, well, he said, well, no, that's not really science. That's in the hands of people who use science for different things. And and what I said was, well, you could apply that to anything. You take religion, and if it's wielded by people whose intentions are, are not very good, you end up with the same exact result. And that's what we're so scarred by, because it's so prominent in religion, sadly. But somehow, I don't blame science, right? Even for the effects that, you know, it has. It has I don't blame technology for, I mean, we are seeing what's happening with technology. There is direct evidence to how the technology platforms that we are using are directly contributing to certain mental illnesses. And yet, <laughs> we don't blame science for it. It seems like it's just a cost of progress. It's a, it's a yeah. byproduct. It's a yeah. cost that along with the, all the progress. Why? is because we are so attached to the outcome of what science can give. And it's, it's also not just like, I want to discover, I want to understand the truth. Because initially, any science begins with wanting to understand the truth. But very soon, what you see is Science is practiced not necessarily for the discovery of truth, but what it can actually give. Well, it's also interesting when you say that, because isn't that also the starting point of any spiritual That's right. paradigm as well? That's right. That's right. <laughs> but it's a, different, it's a different, different result that you're looking for. And they can very much converge if the search for the truth is the single biggest desire. But at some point in time, whether it's science or religion, it diverges from that. I become more attached to the other things that come from it as byproducts. So when you said, you know, the whole notion of progress, that it's a price to pay for the progress, what progress are we talking about? Economic? Mostly economic, right? And this is the other thing. This also leads to, we don't necessarily call it blind faith, but if there were a person who has made it very successful economically, and this person writes a book, it becomes a bestseller. Why? How do I have faith that what this person is saying will work for me? Because I see what this person has become, but not just that, I deeply desire, I so deeply desire what this person has, which is why I don't even question what they're saying, because I'm fueled very strongly by the outcome. And particularly the widespread regard that makes it feel credible. Hey, tons of people think this person's really learned and knows what he or she is talking about. Awesome. I can subscribe to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's an important part of it. Yeah. That's, again, blind faith. Well, and it doesn't feel as blind for some reason because you have the validation of all these other people who also have blind faith. (laughs) So so you, you create enough of a system of validation and somehow I don't I don't even well why am I taking this person's validation seriously? 
You know why? Many times it's because I desire the very thing that this person desires. So there is a sense of unconscious, unintentional alignment that I don't even test. So our notion of progress and everything in the name of progress is a selfish quest for material happiness that actually gives us so much suffering, so many byproducts, that actually is a de-evolution, unfortunately. A real evolution is when we evolve in consciousness and we put faith in things that are so beneficial for the real self of every living being, as opposed to just like ego validation and investing in these temporary identities. That's not progress. It doesn't work. I want to come back to spirituality. I want to come back to this topic of the relationship between faith and knowledge and faith and experience. As we started with faith being associated with blind faith, we think of faith and knowledge being very separate. And we think of faith and experience also being very separate. Like if I have knowledge or if I have experience, then I don't have a need for faith. And if I have faith, then it's a substitute for knowledge and experience. I think it was you, Hari, who mentioned earlier, like, actually, these things go hand in hand. We need yes. a little bit of knowledge to then have faith that then gives us more knowledge and experience that then leads to more faith. But can you just help elucidate this? Yeah, that's it. That our faith is formed based on our experience. And how do we experience something? We need to have a little knowledge to inform how we approach an experience and that it comes or it doesn't come. We have a different experience. So faith and knowledge and experience are all necessary ingredients. In fact, you take just faith and knowledge, we talk about in the Call to Awaken course, they together become the gateway to experience. That's true materially, that's true spiritually, that's true across the board universally. When I have faith, let's use Martin Luther King's analogy, when I have some knowledge, there's a staircase here, and I have faith, even though it's not fully illuminated, I take a step and I get an experience. Okay, that worked. Now I'm going to take another step. Okay, that worked. Now I'm going to take another step. And my knowledge is growing. I'm feeling the staircase unfolding through the knowledge of each step and the experience. So these are all fortifying my faith, my knowledge, and my experience. I need some faith, some knowledge in order to do anything that gives me an experience and determines what is my faith and knowledge base looking like from there? But what draws us to even go in the direction of knowledge is some interest. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really explain what that interest is. And sometimes it's not even interest. It's because somebody forced me to do it. <laughs> right. So it's either a need that I can't really get out of or some pull that brings me to take the first step. And that always exists. This going back to the, my conversation with the same professor, at the end of our conversation, before we parted ways, I just asked him, so why did you choose science? Why did you choose to become who you are? So he just stopped and he laughed because I think he understood what I was pushing towards. And he said, I just liked it. <laughs> but that was his conclusion, right? And that was not like, Oh, it was like I had all this data and, you know, I got and <laughs> just liked it. And that is true. There's some draw. There's something that pulls us in a particular direction. And then we take a step or we choose to then go to a school to study that more deeply or try to experience, just take a small step in the right direction or talk to someone who has interest in the same subject. Can you help connect that with faith? What is that interest? mean in the context of faith, the interest or the desire to do something? How is that related to faith? Something inherently pulls us or pushes us to take the first step. Not knowing what's on the other side, it's not even rational. It's just a pull. <laughs> I can't necessarily explain it. I have some kind of faith that this will be good for me. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're saying that like, if I, if I decide to pursue a certain um, subject area, mm -hmm. 
that's not based on my knowledge that this will work, right? There's some kernel of faith that this is the direction that I should pursue, that I'm being drawn to. Uh, that's right. And in modern days, it's called intuition. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Passion, passion. And intuition then gets can get converted into passion because experiences and repeated immersion in it then has a snowball effect that then starts to become this blazing, it comes out with a blazing intensity. But there is something about intuition, which is why intuition can't be explained or cannot be explained away. And yet we know. We're discovering all these other synonyms for faith in this yes. conversation. Yeah. Or, or uh, we have chosen to use certain words that give us some comfort that we are not faith. Yeah, yeah. As substitutes. I, in, trust your intuition. That exactly. sounds much more reasonable yes. than have blind faith. I mean, there are books written. There's one called Gut Feelings, I believe. And people have tried to study these things and give some science to it. But inherent in that is faith. I was just talking to someone who has spent a lot of time in academics, and she was talking about a podcast that she heard recently about how uh, this particular psychologist that she very deeply respects in the field of academics was talking about how intuition is a very important part of research. And the interviewer said, well, that is so contrary to, <laughs> like, you have always been a data-driven person. Isn't that contrary? And then he started to talk about how your search for data begins by knowing where to look for it, <laughs> right? And what is that? Like any person who has a PhD knows that you have to build a hypothesis. A hypothesis is the expression of an intuition. <laughs> yeah, so you're saying the scientific method begins from a place of faith. It does. And then you have to validate it. Mm -hmm right, which is where a lot of emphasis is placed. But what draws you in that direction is some level of interest. And that requires then, in order to take steps in that direction, it requires some faith. Yeah, I think the thing that has, has been so revelatory for me is that just really seeing how much I operate on faith, I have faith that I'm going to wake up every morning. You know, I will live that next day I mean, there's so many mundane details of my life that are built on faith. Like I, I have faith when I leave to walk the kids to school every morning, I leave with only seven minutes to get them there because I have faith that it will only take us seven minutes. There are a hundred things that could happen <laughs> that, that yes. disrupt that. But then there's so many things on which like I'm operating on faith. Like when I have a Zoom call and... I lit log into Zoom 30 seconds before the call, or in my case, usually two minutes after the call starts, <laughs> then I have faith that that will just, that I'll be able to connect and that all of that will work. And so just seeing, seeing that differently, seeing how much it's operating, that I'm exercising faith in almost everything that I do, changed my relationship with that word. There's a translation of a Bhagavad Gita verse that comes from Rancho Prime, disciple of Srila Prabhupada, who I mentioned earlier as my guru's guru. And uh, in Rancho Prime's translation of this Gita verse, he very, very poignantly frames it that we are all made of faith. We are made of faith. We don't have a choice in that. That's our being. It's intrinsic. So then what we do with it is what counts. Where do we place our faith? why and how, and what do we gain through that? Yeah, it was very powerful to think that we're made, we're made of faith, like that's inherent in our beings as, as humans. And so you put it that way earlier, Hari Prasad, which I appreciated. We have faith. The question is, what are we putting our faith in? And that determines so much of our life. Everything. 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 But for many people, we don't even... Are not we're not even consciously placing our faith. That's what it starts with. Yeah. We're just operating with a lot of faith. We wouldn't even call it faith. We don't even know that we're operating on faith. So when it comes to consciously putting our faith in something, where do those choices come up? Well, it starts with seeing all the things that I already have faith in. 
and testing them. There's an expression that goes, never live with unexamined faith, right? Examine everything. We are so afraid. We're terrified to do that because we'll lose all of our bearings in the world. And our identity, our ego will just be crying helplessly like a child because we'll go back to that childlike state where, oh my God, I've been indoctrinated into a world and I've created an identity that now I don't know that I can believe in. And that is horrifying, horrifying. But that's what it takes. I don't want to be so intimidating, but I want to be a bit intimidating because this is really what's required to live a meaningful life, what to speak of to realize the true self. It is impossible if we don't do that. Absolutely impossible. Forget it. So we have to have a lot of courage here when we approach this subject and we start examining all the different things we have faith in. And then we start seeing, well, is it not unreasonable to place my faith in the path that will unlock the self, even though I can't see the full staircase that leads there. We're not seeking truth anymore. And when Hari Prasad said, never live with unexamined faith, what it means is I'm scrutinizingly looking for what is true. And many times, the reason why I choose not to do it unconsciously is because I'm afraid of what it will show me about myself. I'm afraid of what it will show me about what I'm pursuing. So when we tend to dismiss and associate blind faith with religion, think about how blind we are, that we choose to live our life with unexamined sense of who we are and why we do what we do, right? And this is why one of the things that Hari Prasad referred to Prabhupada, his teacher would say, it's leading the blind. I am blind myself, but I look at somebody else and say, that person is blind. That's also looking at someone blind and thinking that they're not blind and being led by them. That's very, very critical to understand that's what's happening. So what it requires for us is to go back to the basics. And this is what a seeker is. A seeker is a person who wants to understand the truth and is willing to scrutinizingly understand it. That means inquiry, discovery, genuine curiosity. And as soon as we lose our spirit of genuine curiosity, especially geared towards understanding who I am, what's my relationship with this world, I fall into the category of unconsciously putting my faith in things, which then makes me blind. Why does the understanding of faith, this understanding that we're unpacking in this conversation, so important for spiritual exploration? Because spiritual exploration is the search for the self. And how can we continue living without understanding the self? Who am I? And what am I doing here in this world? very existentially. And sometimes it can be, oh, you're talking like those existentialists. But if you really study them, if you really see what they did, they started with the most fundamental question, who am I? And really went about trying to understand that. And to me, that is the exploration of spirituality. Spirituality is the exploration of who I am, which is why it's so fundamental to life. Faith is actually the measure of spiritual progress. Talk about progress real spiritual progress for the attainment of the self, self-realization, fully inhabiting who I am with no more layers of ego, no more identities that are temporary, worldly, material, only seeing myself as an eternal soul and experiencing that. That is all measured by faith, which includes full knowledge and the full experience. I'm actually experiencing my soul and Therefore, no one can convince me otherwise. It's like Srila Prabhupada, he would say, someone was, was marveling, like, why are you so confident? Why are you so confident? How do you do that? It's almost like the nerve of the, <laughs> how do you have that much confidence in something that nobody else is seeing and nobody, like hardly anybody believes in? He would say, well, how can I not? I'm seeing the spiritual reality. I'm seeing God all the time. (laughs) How can I not? There's no way to shake such a person. Now you have to believe that what they're saying is true. You have to actually have that faith, just like you have to have the faith that the person who conducts the scientific experiment is not lying or fudging the numbers, right? So that is there. 
But if you study the person's life and you study their conviction and you line it up with other convictions and you see how they conduct themselves accordingly, it becomes unmistakable. So faith is the measure of everything and it's inclusive of knowledge and experience. One needs knowledge, one needs faith to get an experience. That experience grows, it grows our faith, it grows our knowledge. It's a cyclical affair. It's something which just builds and builds more momentum. And so at the end of the day, somebody who's fully self-realized, they have faith because they're just experiencing the spiritual reality. Spirituality is a journey of faith in answering the question, who I am. That's what spirituality is. And for any other subject, whether it's physics, chemistry, music, we go to a school, we learn from teachers who have walked that path. But somehow, when it comes to spirituality, we don't apply this, this exact same methods that we would apply for learning any other subject. And no rigor, like zero. <laughs> Why do we do that? Especially when it pertains to the most fundamental question, <laughs> most fundamental, who am I? So to me, th that is where it starts, seeking the answer to who I am. And that is a journey of faith. That's what spirituality is. And then all rigor to get to the goal, all rigor, not no rigor. <laughs> and that's what makes it trustworthy. Wonderful. So in a spiritual context, if faith is a measure of our advancement, then how do we gain in faith? If Rasnath, you're leaving us with the question multiple times here that like spirituality is answering the question, who am I? Where do I start? And how do I gain faith that I'm on the right path? By people who have that faith. Just like you go to a school and you have to learn from somebody who has the experience, somebody who has the faith and the knowledge, it's the same on the spiritual path, exactly the same thing. Somebody who has the faith, the knowledge, the experience, you learn from that person. You have to test and verify. You have to make sure the person's trustworthy because there are more false gurus in the spiritual realm than probably there are in the scientific realm. <laughs> so you have to be very careful. But when you find somebody who genuinely has faith and knowledge, and they're speaking from that experience, that's how you can develop the same thing. And you sign up to be taught. You sign up to learn. You sign up to be guided. It's really that simple, but it's extremely rigorous. And it's very, very, very powerful. It's the most transformative thing in existence. The hard part is finding that person. That's right. That is the hard part. That requires work. People don't even know where to start. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, we can help. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we are products of people who sincerely have that experience. And we can vouch for that with our very lives. Also, just uh, drawing the same parallels around going to a, a school to study from people who have actually studied a subject. It's exactly the same method. You study from people who have actually dedicated their lives to studying this subject, which is why if you have to teach in colleges, you need a PhD degree because somebody has absorbed, has spent a, a big chunk of their time deeply immersing in what seems to be like one small part of a really vast subject. We take that seriously. It's the same thing here. There are people who have dedicated their lives and you'll see this universally in any religion. Right? When you study a book, the book is the accounts of people who have studied who I am, the self, in a very deep way. That's what it is. Right? And th there are journals. right? If you, if you look at the different books that have been written by people who have walked this path, they are akin to the journals that have been published in the scientific world. So, so it's pretty much the same from a, from a point of view of process. What we have to do is apply ourselves to studying with them, with the rigor. And the answers come. I think it was maybe the day after, a couple of days after the last time we taught, or you both taught faith and knowledge in, in the fall, I had a, a coaching session where we were actually talking about this topic. And I one of the things that I was sharing as an example of what we have faith, and I was just imagine, I see this always with little kids, babies, the toddlers, that for the first time they discover a light switch and they go and they turn the switch on 
and then they see the light come on and it's 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 truly like magic for them you know it's like what i just controlled that thing from all the way over here and you'll see i mean i've never seen a child not then play up and down up and down up and down see the magic that gets created and you know that's the earliest those early experiences of of faith like i have faith now when i do this again and we'll turn the light on over here and i was we were talking about how it doesn't take long for that magic and that joy to sort of become so normal and then almost like we become jaded like i'm not even thinking of this as a faith experience it's just like this is how things work and we lose the magic the of so, sort of our everyday lives there's so much and the and the conversation that we we're having is if we're more in touch with how we're exercising faith all of the time and there's miracles that are happening around us in every moment i mean many people wouldn't say that turning the light switch on is a miracle but you can if you view it through a different lens there's all of this magic that's happening and especially as we go down the path of spirituality we have so much disbelief in so many things how do we suspend that and see what can happen if i put my faith somewhere and then what can i experience as a result of that instead of denying whatever experiences i might have even before i take one step on that staircase that was really a it was a very invigorating joyful conversation for me that also made me want to be much more in touch with everything that i put my faith in and be less jaded about what's possible well, also science means going down to the root cause if you really want to be scientific that's what it requires so what is the law that allows for that miracle of i flip a switch and a light bulb turns on and then how is that law existing how does that happen how does that work what other laws are there what's behind it then you get into the realm of spirituality of course you have to have a little faith and you have to really learn from people that understand these things but that is what is required very good i think that's a perfect spot to to end this conversation leaving us with uh, hunger for a little more and also um very rich uh thoughtful thought provoking experience so thank you both so much thank you for evolving my own understanding of faith in class and in the, and in this conversation and that's a lifelong impact to change one's association with the idea of faith the word faith and then um then the exploration of that from a from a spiritual paradigm is uh one of the greatest gifts that i've received from both of you so thank you very very much from the bottom of my heart thank you thank you to everyone listening we really really want this to serve you in every way thank you for listening to upbuilding the self upbuild is a leadership development company that offers workshops coaching and other services to help you on the path towards being your best self free from the shackles of the ego to learn more about our work visit our website upbuild.com and sign up for our newsletter to gain access to podcasts, reflections, and upcoming events. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes to leave us a review so that others can find and benefit from the podcast. We look forward to being with you again next time.